There it is. Forgive me if you heard this joke 11 times already today. Uh, there was some dead time on a typical boring uh, corporate conference call at HP today, and, and somebody said, does anybody have any jokes? And somebody said, the, um, how do you test a digital microphone? Zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. Ha, ha, ha. Figured you, figured you might have heard that already. Sorry, that's weak. All right, Dave. Um, are you going to sit down? This is going to make me really uncomfortable. I don't want to make you nervous. Yeah, can I get a chair up yeah, here? Yeah, get a chair. Dave doesn't want me to be taller than he is. No. All right. So as we're waiting for that, let's just kind of get into it. We've heard a lot today about kind of the impact of technology uh, in the world of consumerism. And as an artist, we, we're all just dying to know here. Thank you, Todd. Uh, what's your setup? How do you like to consume music today? We heard about subscription services. We heard a lot about iTunes and iPhone today. Maybe there's something I haven't even thought of. But tell us a little bit about... How do I like <laughs> to consume music? That's right. Um, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, like many customers, I, so, so uh, a little bit about what I spend my time doing now. I was, uh, I've had, I'm one of those people, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, the woman from Microsoft who was in the last panel, Lily referred Chang. to multidimensional personalities. I'm one of those uh, multi-untalented people who, I've done a million things. I've been a teacher, I was a public affairs executive, then I was a rock star. Then as I brought my own band's IP into the digital age, got deeper and deeper into digital media and ended up uh, on the advisory board and then the executive staff of a venture-backed startup. And now we sold ourselves to Hewlett Packard and now I've spent 18 months inside the largest technology company on earth, one of 325,000 employees. So I have multiple perspectives on the music thing, but I do spend my day thinking about you know, how do people want to experience music? Um, how do they experience music? I, I, don't, I don't know how I experience music. now. I don't know how I like to do it. That's a problem in the business, and I think it's a problem for media and digital media in general. There are two, you know, I think there are two major trends right now, especially in, in digital music, uh, and they're somewhat paradoxical and contradictory. One is a, an infinite uh, bifurcation, expansion, fragmentation of how people and where people, when people listen to music, right? You, you, you have, you know, literally even just with web radio stations and uh, from the guy in his bedroom who runs a little web radio station to Pandora, a nearly infinite number of options. Um, and then, you know, so I use YouTube. If I want to hear a song for the first time, I, if I'm reading, um, somebody says, hey, you know, I went to a show at the High Dive the other day and there was this great band some tiny band that's played three shows in Seattle, I'll go to YouTube and I'll f find them. Um, if I really want to listen to music, I'll probably go into iTunes and pull up my collection that I own. I have Rhapsody and Spotify subscriptions, and so when I decide I want to listen to Louis Armstrong's Hot Five for two hours, I'll go to Rhapsody and listen to that. The, the, and then the contradictory trend is this, uh, this real focusing and reduction of where people buy music. I mean, as most of you probably know, iTunes is the biggest music store in the world now. Not just brick and mortar, not just uh, digital, but the, you know, the number one retailer of music, which is, was incomprehensible 10 years ago, right? And, and very, very good for my business, the, the other part of my life where I still run the president's business selling our content. So... I'm all over the place, like most people. I, I mean, if anybody knows how people want to listen to music, you know, it's the problem with focus groups, right? People have all sorts of ideas about how, what they think they want, they do, and want to do, which, you know, usually they need Steve Jobs to tell them what they should be doing, right? I mean... All right, Dave. So you've already fessed up to having multiple personalities. You certainly right. have multi multiple talents, a uh, triple threat here. You've uh, gone away from the rock star, Dave. We'll get back there shortly. But let's no. talk about the business of music. You've been in the music business for about 20 years. And yeah. obviously, the landscape has changed. Some players are getting disintermediated. Others are, are coming along. Uh, can you talk just briefly about you know who are the winners and the losers in this changing game of digital music? and technology? Well, um, the, I'm a winner, um, and I happen to be lucky because... You are a winner. I, I, <laughs> yes, and, and, and that concludes my talk for tonight. <laughs> uh, no, the presidents happened to own our first album. We had recorded it before we signed a record deal with Columbia Sony Records, and uh, we licensed it to them, and we had a fairly crafty reversion of the rights to the master recordings for that record, and we got the rights to that back within six, seven years after it was a hit record. So when we sell a song on iTunes for 99 cents, we pocket 70 cents. 
Uh, and so for me, this very direct, and, and every other digital service, we go through an aggregator, IOTA, the Orchard, and they take a, f a few percent, but we get you know 55 to 65% there. And um, it's great for us. We have this content that was under license to Sony and just languishing there. I'm talking, you know, our record was a, our first record was a hit, 95 to 97. From 99, 2000, it's just selling one, 2,000 units a month worldwide. We're fighting Sony to get paid. Our pittance are 16% on retail of that. Now we sell 15, 20,000 songs a month and we pocket 70% of that right to us. And it's not a living for us, uh, but it's a lovely annuity that it wasn't there. Ten years ago, if, if we were in the traditional model, we'd be getting our pittance every six months when we get our royalty statement from Sony. So we're winners. If you own your content, and you, there's a certain bridging category of artists who had the benefit of um, major labels building our brands and our, our presence in the market, and then are getting the, the tailing benefit of that now and owning the content, it's great. Uh, I think even for new artists, it's better. They just, you know, if you own your content and it's valuable, you're in a much better position. Now, the major labels are the losers. They're the ones who own the master recordings, not the song publishing. The publishers are doing better. The labels are the losers. They should not be because they're essentially in the business that my little company that owns the president's rights is in, which is controlling back catalog. Uh, records that came out a long time ago that people still buy. And back catalog constitutes an increasing percentage of music sales. And these guys should just be printing money. You could run the back catalog for Columbia Records, which is Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, uh, you know, a Blue Oyster Colt, the list could go on all day. Um, you could run their back catalog with a staff of, you know, one attorney and four to ten accounts people, period. And, you, and your margin should be like 98%. But they don't, they're not doing that because they're still coming off the, you know, the fumes of the crack of the, you know, <laughs> this, the CEO making $6 million a year and having the private car from Greenwich to Midtown every day. And right. that's right. the expectation still. Yeah, no, it, there certainly seems to have been a democratizing trend there. And without giving too much away, I, I used to yearn and certainly remember the days of B-sides, you know, when, when artists uh, could come out with something bold, maybe that they produced in their garage. But you think about it, these days, the barrier to entry to get into this industry is lower. Maybe everything's a B-side. Maybe everything's an A-side. It almost doesn't matter anymore. I, I was thinking about it uh, this morning. Uh, a woman who used to work uh, with me at a public affairs firm is now the editor of City Arts Magazine. And I was waiting for a meeting this morning at King FM. I'm on their new media advisory committee, along with some real superstars, Carl Siebrecht and Tom Alberg, among others. And I was looking at the City Arts magazine, and there was a list of shows for The More and The Paramount. And, you know, I'm 47 years old. I have two kids. I'm not that au courant anymore. But I'm in the music business, and I do pay attention, and I know who new artists are. And I was looking down a list of these shows for The More which in, and The Paramount, which are, depending on how you scale the venue, anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 seats. They're sizable theaters. There are people coming through that I've never heard of. Never heard on the radio. Never seen, you know, uh, marketed, sponsored. But they're on YouTube. Yeah, they're on YouTube. Absolutely. And they have a great network, and they have a great right. Facebook fan page, and all of a sudden they're traveling around the U.S. Um, selling out 1,500 to 3,000 seat theaters. Yeah. That's amazing. It's so powerful. for those musicians who are truly dedicated to building an audience and to having a craft and, and making their art, they're big winners. Because you couldn't do that 15 years ago, right, unless right. you were in the machine. Well, hey, Dave, we want to have you play us into our reception here. But, uh, you know, any parting words, I'd love to just hear about how technology, you know, how this changing landscape has impacted your artistic process. If there are any words you want to say uh, before you give us an example, uh, that'd be great. You know, I don't. Uh, I I move further and further away from technology. It's funny uh, as a creative. <laughs> yeah, I see process. your acoustic I mean, this guitar is here. Of, That's this old is school. kind of it now. I've gone. I used to have a home studio, and in the early era of um, you know PC-based recording technology, I used to use a program called Acid from a company called Sonic Foundry, which is a great beats looping thing. And then I started to go into Pro Tools, and it, it was just like this rat hole that I decided not to go down. So 
it, for me, it has actually been liberating in a way because I used to um, really be interested, particularly when it was analog, the recording process and the signal chain and how stuff gets to tape and what, you know, the, down to the capacitors and resistors. Um, it's so deep and 100% um, binary and beyond me now that I've kind of given up on it, which has been really freeing. I now have back to when I record something, I just say, I'm going to go to a recording studio where you know, there's a professional person who knows how to uh, run the recording studio. Right. So. Right. Well, Dave, as you know, you and I are the last thing standing between this audience and a cocktail. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way. And we would love to uh, hear some of your musical stylings. <laughs> I thought we were going to do a long interview and then I was going to just. <laughs> no, we want a party, notes. Dave. This, this crowd is ready to go. So take, take us home. Okay. Hey, you in the cheap seats in the back. That's right. Yeah, Thanks those talking are you. To you. Hey, everybody back there who already has a drink. <laughs> Can you guys turn around and shout out those people? <laughs> that, one, the most amazing thing, one of the great things about this event, I just walked in 45 minutes ago. I mean, I really got into the technology world in the um, in Seattle area seven, eight years ago when I joined uh, Melodio's advisory board before joining the staff. And I knew John Cook as this kind of um, snarky uh, journalist who you had to somewhat fear because he was, was uh, someone who could make your life more difficult or less difficult depending on what he had to say about your startup and where you were and your funders. And, and, you know, and then uh, that, that whole world kind of wound down, the PI, and, and John launched this venture. And uh, I thought, wow, that's, you know, is there a there there? And here it is, you know, a year or two later. And he, not only, he, I mean, John and Todd are now, uh, they're not observers. It, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship now. They're not observers. They're creators right. in, this, uh, in mm -hmm. this environment. And that's a really amazing thing. So I would say, first of all, kudos to Todd and John. Congrats. Happy birthday, us. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I had one request. What's that? Happy birthday to you, everybody, please. Happy birthday to you. Well, thank you, Dave. Happy birthday, dear Todd, John, Rebecca, Geek Wire. Geek Wire. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Thank you, Dave. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Geekwire. Happy birthday to you. And uh, it's party time, right? <laughs> so I invite you to all, I'll get up and go get a glass of wine because I already had one. <laughs> um, this last song. Um, actually, I was going to sing this Velvet Underground song, but maybe I'll do... Um, this is a song my mom used to sing to me. Fortunately, she's still around. She doesn't sing it to me anymore because I'm not a little kid. But uh, this song, I've always loved this song, and it it um, it uh, it had, I, I thought I spent some time thinking the last two days what songs are about technology. None, you know. Good songs about no zero good songs about technology. So this song has a sentiment uh, about, um, you know, aspiration and, and uh, for some of us, what technology can do uh, for us as a, as a place to, as a, as a means and a mode for solving uh, modern problems. It has nothing to do with technology. It's only a paper moon. Hanging over a cardboard sky But it wouldn't be make-believe If you believed in me It's a Barnum and Bailey world Just as phony as it can be But it wouldn't be make-believe If you believed in me Without your love Life's a honky-tonk parade Without your love It's a melody played in a penny arcade It's a, only a paper moon Hanging over a muslin sky But it wouldn't be make-believe If you believed in me 
that's kind of like being a venture funded startup, right? It's, it's really all smoke and mirrors and BS until, you know, the rubber meets the road and you, you make something happen. Without your love or your venture capital, it's a honky tonk parade. Without your love, it's a melody played in a penny arcade. It's only a paper moon hanging over a cardboard sky. But it wouldn't be make believe if you believed in me. Okay, now party time. All right, we feel the love. Hope you guys do too. Turn that drink ticket from InfoSpace into a delicious, devilicious cocktail or anything that you choose. Bars are open. Make sure you check out all the amazing interactive sponsor booths. We've got giveaways. It wouldn't be a GeekWire party without some Xbox Connect packages. Check out the performance art at the filter station. That's really the only way to describe it and uh, keep the party going. You've been wonderful. Thanks for coming along with us on the journey. John, Todd, Jonathan, and I, thank you all, and thank you, Dave. Oh, yeah. Party on. Okay. Oh, we are going to have a real good time together. I said, oh, we're going to have a real good time together. Oh, we're going to dance and laugh and shout together. Oh, we're going to dance a real good time together. Uh, nah, 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 nah. Please get a drink. <laughs>